Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Conversations program. My name is Emily Villar, and I run this edition of um, the Conversations program here in Basel this year. I'm delighted uh, this afternoon to welcome this wonderful um, array of guests for the panel entitled A Hundred Years of Boys, which of course looks back at the legacy of Joseph Boys. Um, I will shortly hand over to our moderator for this panel, Maya Visma, who is the head of contemporary art as, at the Kunstmuseum in Basel. And she will do the um, proper introductions. Um, but before that, may I just kindly remind you to keep your masks on at all times. There'll be a chance to ask some questions and towards the end of the talk, our hosts will hold the microphone up for you to talk into. Please keep the, mic, uh, the mask on. Thank you very much. And I shall now hand over to Maya. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. <clears throat> So, hello, good evening from my side as well. Uh, it's quite an honor and a, a challenge, a positive challenge, to be sitting here with two colleagues, Catherine Nichols, who is the um, curator and artistic director of Boys 2021, um, a major uh, endeavor on boys' work, past and uh, future perspectives. We will talk about that later. I also encountered her work earlier in 28. She did. She was the co-curator of a major Joseph Beuys exhibition at Hamburger Bahnhof uh, that came with a very important publication. And I feel that is sort of when there was some kind of a new spirit awakening in Beuys um, scholarship, but also the practice of exhibition making. Oh. So it's great to um, get to know you, finally. <laughs> and then um, Philipp Ursprung, Professor of Art History and Art and Ar Architecture at the ETH in Zurich, uh, author of the widely acclaimed book, Joseph Beuys, Kunst, Kapital, Revolution. Um, before that, I, I mainly encountered his work on Robert Smithson and Alan Capro and um, any, on many other um, artists, but also methodological questions, actually. And um, it's a great honor also to uh, finally actually meet you in person. Um, so yeah, here we are. And I should um, be more precise on my title and it brings us right into the topic, actually. Uh, so I'm, I'm not only the head of contemporary art, but I'm actually, I have a very long title. I'm the head of art after 1960 slash contemporary art. And this kind of matters uh, when talking about boys in Basel, I think, because um, I don't think anyone would debate on that Joseph Beuys is still contemporary. So, um, but we do have, a, I, th I think, and I say that also out publicly, that um, Joseph Beuys in 1969 uh, brought international um, contemporary art to Basel. Uh, since then, there is sort of the understanding that contemporary art is something that we would want to focus on in the collection. And when he was, he, he came to Basel in 1969 with two years in one, two shows in one year. And um, people were outraged and there were so many debates. I think we would wish for still having such debates on the exhibitions we do at Kunstmuseum Basel. And it became quite clear that um, the museum would need to have to change to some extent to accommodate that kind of work if there were this dedication to be constant. And uh, he reappeared. He came invited by Theater Basel in 1971 to do a widely acclaimed um, performance, Celtic. It was called at the time. And by then, Kunstmuseum Basel, the public art collection, sort of continuously worked on, f on making it possible to acquire a piece uh, of work by Joseph Beuys to keep in the permanent collection, which up until that point, there were only um, uh, temporary loans. And so in uh, 1977, they bought a work which had been on show at Art Basel, actually, in 1974, 
at the booth of Ronald Feldman at the time, and only in 77 it was uh, they were able to buy it, and they bought it for the at the time, outrageous sum of 300,000 Swiss francs, still a very high price, but at the time, outrageously high, and, uh, and, and the, there was a huge public debate on how dare you to spend public money on, on this and so much public money. And, um, and, and as you may know, there is uh, Basel Carnival is an important um, cultural moment in the public life and it's also a moment when um, everyone is making fun of past events so um, it was clear that the boys acquisition would be a major protagonist of carnival in 78 and um, and by now world famous architects uh, Jacques Herzog and Pierre Dumeron at the time active in the carnival um, approached Joseph Boyce and invited him to 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 take a role in that carnival situation and um, what followed is a much talked about story in in local uh, rumors and conversations and because we ended up with a second boys piece and uh, he applied what I sometimes call a, a refined version of recycling. <laughs> there was this uh, carnival um, uh, going on and, and one uh, group of carnival active of active carnival people sort of had a boys designed costume and um, he ended up turning that into a, a, a monumental piece of sculpture which we now of course show um, as, as sort of an echo of the piece that was acquired in 1977, Feuerstätte and Feuerstätte 2, fireplace, the hearth and hearth 2. So this was kind of a lengthy introduction, I'm sorry, but I think it gives a, a background on also why Kunstmuseum Basel has a continued interest in Joseph Beuys. And um, it also sort of uh, connects to, because he had been sort of the spearheader of contemporary art in Basel, it's also a challenge for me to, to ask the question of when does co the contemporary art actually start. So I take him as a, yeah, well, not him maybe, but discussions around him as this, as a sort of a reason to keep asking this question too. So um, concluding this week and this uh, program of conversation with a conversation of 100 year of Joseph Beuys could also be kind of, of a nostalgic thing, I think. And uh, I was looking through the program also falling sometimes. I mean, he, Joseph Beuys really could have been a contributor to any of the conversations that they had this last week, be it the one on collectors, artists, influencers, contemporary art in the theater, the Anthropocene, rewriting the future, public art, the artist and the gallerist, NFTs in the art world, except for maybe gal um, how galleries adapt to a changing landscape. I'm not sure he would have been such a great conversation partner there, but um, this sort of, um, yeah, I think this is quite fascinating that, uh, and maybe at the end of the day, he's not such a nostalgic topic anymore. And um, maybe we could, start there and it also connects, we had a brief conversation before that, it also connects to an entry moment that you, Philip, um, brought to the table. Uh, what would Joseph Boyce say uh, to this situation and to the fair? <laughs> Maybe you elaborate. Yeah. Or get uh, there, start it there. <laughs> thanks. So uh, Maya talked about the, the works of art that uh, are in Basel, the carnival. There's another event uh, where Beuys is involved in Basel, this is this dialogue, uh, ein Gespräch, which was held in the Kunsthalle in uh, summer and fall 1985 between uh, Beuys and three other colleagues, uh, Janis Kunelis, uh, Enzo Kuki, uh, both are actually with works right uh, in front of the place they were talking, the Unlimited. And, and Anselm Kiefer, uh, and uh, Jean-Christophe Ammann is moderating, and Jacqueline Burkhardt transcribes and edits this book. And uh, it, it, it allows one to kind of go right into the way Boyce uh, talks and speaks. And I might just quote a little part. Now, they're talking about his conception of jeder ist ein Künstler, everyone's an artist, and Kiefer 
uh, slightly younger, uh, trying to oppose his former teacher, says, yeah, I, I don't really believe in this concept. Beuys, wenn du ein waches Auge hast für das Menschliche, kannst du sehen, dass jeder Mensch ein Künstler ist. Ich war jetzt in Madrid und habe gesehen, wie die Männer bei der Müllabfuhr arbeiten, große Genies sind. I just come back from Madrid and saw how the people working for the garbage sanitation are great geniuses. Das erkennt man an der Art, wie die ihre Arbeit tun und was für Gesichter sie haben. You see how they work and the faces they make. Man sieht, dass sie Vertreter einer zukünftigen Menschheit sind. Und ich habe etwas bei den Müllabfuhrleuten gesehen, was ich bei den Scheißkünstlern vermisse. Denn die Künstler sind zum großen Teil opportunistisch. Sie sind Arschlöcher. Das muss ich jetzt auch mal sagen. I saw something at these uh, men, which I miss with most artists. They are mainly opportunist assholes. This has to be said. So, yeah, that would be probably more or less like this, that boys would sit here. Look at this show. Look at how much decoration is. None of the ideas that we're developing about art and society are, are considered at all. This is an exclusive place for decorative art. No? And then, of course, the discussion would uh, uh, go on. He goes on, actually, and says that, um, that the artists, in his view, although there are no real classes anymore, the artists are the last to form a class. Sie sind die Letzten, die noch eine Klasse bilden, und zwar eine ganz reaktionäre Klasse. Uh, so this is his, his, uh, his way of dealing with jeder ist ein Künstler. And we, we can learn from it that it's, it's not a, a repetition of fixed uh, definitions that he preaches. It's using the term to constantly question agreements and what we think is, is, is granted and, and question the role, the question, uh, question why, why one does art. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and to sum up, uh, in my view, this is something which interests me. You know? In what sense can boys function as, as a mirror mm. of the present? Yeah? This is 85, this is a while ago. We can historize it, but we can also use it as a mirror to, to look into it and uh, see how would our own present be reflected. Eh? We could also go back 13 years um, to the documenta 1972, uh, where somebody, for the people who don't know, that was when um, Boyce set up the Office for Direct Democracy as a work of art within the Friedrichianum in Kassel, in where the, the central museum there that plays a major role. And um, he, he set up this work there and invited people in to talk about direct democracy with him. And so for the 100 days of the documenta, people debated with him on this very question that Philip, you just posed, like what is art and, and what are artists and are, is everybody an artist and, and what does that mean if you have that as a prerequisite. And interestingly, one of the women um, in the audience said, because uh, Boyce had just sold a work of art at an art fair for an extraordinary amount of money, René Bloch had sold it. Um, and um, this woman said, you know, but you're actually part of the system, um, aren't you? And, um, and Boy said, yes, of course I'm part of the system. Um, and uh, and, and uh, proceeded to suggest that it's not actually a contradiction, interestingly. that um, So he, he probably would have been critiquing the art fair and also being very much part of the art fair and knowing that he's using, I mean, his argument was, and it's an argument we hear a lot, actually, that he was using the system, he was earning money with the system in order to invest it um, in other things, in, in social sculpture and in working in a, with a more research and community-based practice, you know, in a way that people today, I suppose, uh, mainly associate, associate with someone like Theaster Gates, who um, argues similarly with this recirculation of capital but yeah, you see, you see someone with voice uh, who, where he was often faced with that sort of accusation of um, uh, being a very contradictory figure. Absolutely, I think I think he was he was part of Art Basel probably every year since its first iteration in 1970, and uh, he never really saw that as a contradiction. In mm. fact, um, absolutely. But uh, I kind of um, stumbled into this conversation, and I I want to take a step back and you've already shared some expertise and this talk is announced as a conversation among boys expert, experts and I would be quite interested in um, uh, hearing more about how the two of you became an expert. 
maybe, Catherine, do you want to? Oh, um, I, I never feel like a voice expert, <laughs> actually. Um, I'm Australian. I, um, I came to art history by coincidence, and I started to work at Hamburger Bahnhof in 2003, and that was actually my first encounter with voice. I could have encountered voice back in Australia. In the, there's a, a very important voice work, actually, in the National Gallery in Canberra. And um, I was probably there on a school excursion, but I really don't remember seeing it, shamefully. So um, that's not a good start for an expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then when I started working at Hamburger Bahnhof, I think that was the fascinating thing for me because I'd never seen art like that. Um, I was, the, my first encounter was with the sculptural work. I don't know if you've all been to Hamburger Bahnhof, you probably have. And, um, and there are some extremely um, monumental sculptures that have this um, visceral, kind of very material feeling to them. You can smell them, you can sort of feel them in the air, and, and you can sense um, this sort of corporeality as you, you, you can't help but relate physically to them. And um, the, the visual vocabulary that, um, of, of these great big fat, uh, like, um, what's that called in English, actually? Tag. Um, I've forgotten what it's called. The f anyway, the, the tallow. Yeah, ta yeah, tallow oh, blocks, oh. and um, or the stone, the basalt uh, stone sculptures. Um, I think that that's something that sh uh, that was pretty much the initiation. And when I saw, I think probably the critical moment was when I saw the first action by Boyce, and that was the one that everybody knows. I like America, and America likes me. Where Boyce, um, it was inside the Rene Block Gallery in New York in 1974. Uh, with a coyote for a week, and um, I think that was the moment where I thought, okay, this person's very interesting. This is a, this is a fascinating artist. How does the action relate to the the work, uh, the sculptural work that I'd first seen? Um, and then suddenly realizing that it was an entire cosmos, a very complex cosmos with its own set of metaphors, its own set of vocabulary. Um, reading, coming to terms with it takes you from right back to ancient Egypt um, through all the philosophy with you know, major um, visits to German idealism and German romanticism and, and everywhere. So I think that was like, the, I think my main um, jumping into the swimming pool at the deep end was working on the voice retrospective with Eugen Blumer, who is actually considered a voice expert, and, um, and having to somehow manage that project. And, and it was a fascinating task, and I had to read a million things. If you see the, the list of books that Boyce had in his library, even just to see what did Boyce actually read. Um, so there are pages and pages of Rudolf Steiner, as you would imagine, and, um, but there are pages and pages of other things, and just trying to get a grasp of what Boyce had actually read and, and, and marked to them. I mean, he, he left, he made a lot of notes in the book so that you actually know what he did read and didn't read. Um, so I think that was just, it's been, for me, it's been a very long process. That was 2008. Now we're 2021. I've just spent two very intense years um, researching Boyce again and um, not growing bored. And that's probably something that you can say about very few artists, that you would, you would spend that much time talking that much about one artist, one practice, one body of work, and, um, and still be finding things that you have, nothing, uh, have no conception of and, and being fascinated by. And I'm sure that's something that you could sort of agree with, Philip. I mean, mm -hmm. you spent a very intense research period and probably also have this sense of scratching the surface. Yeah, my, my first encounter was as a student, a student excursion to uh, Schaffhausen, Hallen für Neue Kunst, 87 or so. And uh, boys had just passed, but we, we didn't know so much about this person. I was fascinated to be in a museum that I've never encountered before, an, an old factory building in this former industrial town, kind of a factory ruin near the Rheinfall. <laughs> All this energy which was was around, but not in the factory anymore. And then on, on two stories, a, a, a monumental installation called Das Kapital, Raum 1970 bis 77. So I, I didn't get it. I still don't totally get it. But I was confronted with something uh, which I thought this this uh, this is why I'm studying art history to figure out mm -hmm. uh, what this is about. Uh, and then I I kind of took a distance because uh, Boyce was so much uh, discussed. There were so many experts that I didn't dare to uh, to approach the subject matter. And it was actually only 
only uh, three years ago when, when the um, editor of, of Beck Verlag asked me, w would you consider writing about boys, that I thought perhaps I, I should now return to this fascination uh, that I had as a student and, and try to figure out, is, is there an approach which um, is appropriate to, to me and the current situation, uh, which of course builds on all these expertise, but also doesn't build on the um, the uh, the tradition of uh, if you write about boys, you have had to know him. No? Mm. Uh, so I'm not uh, I'm I'm not a disciple. I'm not a spokesman for, for this art. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at it as a historian. And you said it's the beginning of contemporary art. For me also the question is, uh, yeah, when, when does contemporary art perhaps end? Uh, when does something become art history? You know? uh, in, in Unlimited, I think the, the rule is it has to be contemporary. But there's also several artists that are not alive anymore, so this, this shift, when does it start to lose its energy or become history, this, this intrigues me. And, mm -hmm. and in my view, that's also why I, I enjoy it, uh, to work on it and why I enjoy also continuing to work at it. A lot of the aspects are remaining contemporary. Eh? Uh, we cannot close this case. Eh? I think that's something that even in the course of the year, I feel like Boyce became more contemporary. Um, when we first started off preparing the Boyce 2021 project, which is a couple of years ago now, about two and a half years ago, um, and I remember the, the very early conversations that we had with all, it's actually a project, just for those who don't know, um, it's based in North Rhine-Westphalia and um, meanwhile has partners in 80 different cities around the world, it just, um, which shows how relevant Boyce has become, interestingly. Um, but when we first started, we were thinking we'd probably do about six exhibitions in North Rhine-Westphalia and that'd be it. And um, we, we approached all the museums and we said, um, you know, we, we think Boyce is very contemporary because um, for, for the environmental reasons, for the fact that Boyce was looking at um, how to keep democracy alive and, and in the sense that we have to enact democracy um, and in a very sculptural form, that it's, it's, there is no final form of democracy and it's certainly not when you vote um, once every four years, but it's um, this constant sort of process that we're involved in in our everyday lives. So with questions like this, and the economy, of course, Das Kapital, I mean, what Philip, you, what you just mentioned then, that's, that was actually Boyce's, one of his sort of major realizations in the 1970s when he thought, okay, um, democracy, educate, like he sort of did things in three steps, first direct democracy, then realizing that you need education for direct democracy to, to work properly. And then in the 70s, he came to the realization that actually capital is the key question. So all of this makes no sense unless that we reform the, the, the capital, um, the capitalist system. So um, I think when we, when we approach people and we just mentioned these three points, um, then everybody started to say that they wanted to be involved and they didn't want to be involved in a typical art historical manner, they wanted to be involved in a very discursive manner. So these are all fairly sort of um, traditional museums at first and then other people came on board too. But the, the traditional museums were saying, no, we want to do a Boyce exhibition, but we don't want to do Boyce exhibitions like we've done them before. Um, there are a few art historical exhibitions like um, one just about to open um, in a few weeks, Boyce and Duchamp, which is going to be extremely exciting, I think, um, but it's also extremely political. Um, likewise with uh, Wilhelm Lehmbruck and Boyce, so they're, they're just two that took an art historical perspective and they were also saying that it's about regenerate, the regeneration of society, the transformation of society. And then um, beyond that, there are heaps of exhibitions and heaps of um, symposia and theatre performances and music performances, which actually really wanted to look at the ideas that Boyce had, and it's the ideas that make him absolutely contemporary. And um, I had the same experience, what you said, Maya, when I was standing outside looking at the conversations that have taken place this week, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I've read all of these people's work. I've looked at all of these people's work in conjunction with the Boyce activities of this year. So I totally agree with you that mm. um, and and also in his controversial nature as an artist I mean in, in in raising the question that is still so pertinent in German society today um, is in how do we how do we deal with memory how do we look at the past um, who was how did Boyce um, deal with his own involvement in, in national socialism 
Um, that, that's a debate that's been conducted with the same, with more vehemence than ever, interestingly, which shows that there's so much to still to be discussed, and that question too has a contemporaneity um, that is not to be ignored or denied. Maybe something that brings your two uh, positions, um, even if neighboring and, and exchanging position, brings it together. I thought it was very convincing in your book, actually, when you say, well, um, it's time to look at what were the circumstances that allowed boys to become boys. And I think this feedback moment is, is now um, uh, so much more intriguing than the, the work maybe exclusively and isolated, or I say the sculptural work maybe exclusively isolated, really understanding where do his terms come from, where is this need for activism in uh, political questions, and where is this space of maneuver that he actually had, where is the, the stages? <laughs> He got, how did these stages come about? I think this is, this is really um, a very interesting entry point in, in boys from today's perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, also sort of revisiting history um, then uh, makes us realize how, uh, how the topics reappear <laughs> and also why he is so contemporary mm -hmm. today. And uh, yeah, maybe it's more in this uh, understanding how it functioned mm -hmm. than the, the so-called uh, work exclusively, I think, yeah. Yeah, and, and the, the, the question to access the pass uh, is uh, an exciting one. I was very impressed by, uh, by the way that uh, uh, Stefan Müller, who, who happens to be in the room, uh, reenacts uh, parts of, uh, of Beuys' Oeuvre with the Staatstheater in Kassel, in the Aktion Boys. And this, this Gespräch, for instance, which is, is treated in excerpts and, and performed by four female actors, performers, a part of it, of course, uh, which in a way is, is both very amusing because, of course, they also make fun uh, about these, these four uh, male heroes that, uh, that try to be the, the best on stage. But it also shows how accurate uh, and how, how clear and how vivid these debates at that time happened. So the, the reenactment to, to repeat something, uh, for me also f in, the, in the method of, of writing the book, was important. I, I, I go to the sites, I travel there, I see what it looks like, I see the exhibitions, and I kind of lead the, the readers there. Eh? It, uh, also, in, in a way, learning from boys that it's important to, to go out there, to get rid of this, this distance and this quasi-objectivity and, and mingle in, into, into the action. Eh? Yeah. And th uh, th this is at least uh, one way of, of also writing history in a, in a performative way. Huh? Yeah, and speaking about the method of working on boys, um, uh, I, I think uh, throughout his lifetime, um, while he always made a point that the different components of the work all belong to one strand, <laughs> Um, like the performance aspect is one, the political aspect is one, and the sculpture. Um, people still treated them separately quite a bit. Um, so there were experts on drawing, experts on, on the plastic, on the sculpture, and experts on working with him on discursive moments. And uh, I think it was really only after his passing, I believe with uh, Theodora Fischer's dissertation actually, that, that the whole boys <laughs> became, um, that the whole oeuvre became the work in a way that we were able to see that this is all coming together. And I, I, I sense now, and also I think from looking at your publications, that you chose <laughs> a way back and actually entered the work in um, chapters and tableaus. So really splicing, uh, slicing it up again. Mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, maybe maybe you could elaborate a bit on that. I think because I think it's helpful <laughs> to descaling again, to to be yeah, the rescaling. So the idea was to uh, look at the work of boys as if it would be a big exhibition or a landscape that you can travel through, and in order to not fall into trap of categorizing. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and 
cutting up the work in, into two narrow frames, which for me was always a, a, a hindrance to access it. Uh, I called it tableau. Huh? Yeah. Uh, as, as, a, as something which is not the same as a chapter. Huh? And it's almost like an, an entry point uh, for a sketch, uh, an essay. It's an essayistic approach also, mm -hmm. which allows me to to uh, kind of test ideas without saying this is this is the final answer uh, because I, I don't I have it. It's more an encounter. Yeah. And uh, and uh, this allows me to be very subjective. I, I go to these works and topics which I find interest and where also I think that I'm more or less competent expert enough to deal with it. So a lot of it is, is not in there. There's, there's, there's almost no drawing in there, for instance. Yeah. Uh, there is almost no anthroposophy in there. There's, there's many issues that I don't touch uh, because I would get totally lost. And, and others uh, which I, I try to almost dive in and which I th perhaps uh, rediscover, like the Aktion im Moor, uh, which, which mm -hmm. has very little treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's this this fantastic moment where he drives to an exhibition and then apparently spontaneously, without preparation, says, stop the car. He sees a, a, a swamp, jumps into this swamp, starts to behave like animals, dives into the mud. Uh, <laughs> Just when it was getting exciting. <laughs> Keep it in mind. <laughs> <laughs> we were advised not to interrupt this voice. It fits well with what I want to say. So Boyce dives into the swamp <laughs> as if he would be a frog. No, but he does not take off the hat. So he does not identify totally with an animal. No? It's uh, like we're not totally immersed. It's always the voice of uh, Art Basel that's, that's hovering above us. And so that, that was one, one of these examples which I, I tried to, to use as, as an entry point again. And it, it relates perhaps to the way you, you uh, designed the exhibition in Düsseldorf. I was super happy to see the <laughs> image from the Aktion im Moor uh, and the poster. And I remember you made this fantastic uh, big volume uh, monumental volume in 2008 in Berlin, which is a standard work. And in Dusseldorf, uh, you have a much more playful, more lighter approach. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you can, you can tell me how you got to this uh, approach in Dusseldorf, in the, the current exhibition. Yeah. Huh? No, it's, it's interesting because I mean, a lot of what you said really resonates with the approach that I also have taken and I've taken um, in collaboration with others. I should point that out too because the first project was a collaboration with Eugen Blumer and the second project in Dusseldorf just recently was, is a collaboration with Eugen Blumer again and with Isabel Meitz who's a curator at, at K21 and K20 Kunstsammlung NRW. And um, so, I mean, partly it has to do with the people that what the, the different approach you take, but it also has to do with the passing of time. And I think that um, th I love that action, by the way, that Philip just you just described, um, and that uh, Isabel does too. We all do. So it ended up on the cover. Mm. Um, it's like a baptism that Boyce goes through, and um, and he comes out, and yet he's he does a like a sort of like an exercise position, like with one leg out like this, um, with this kind of, he was very focused on the knee. Um, I won't go into detail about that, but it was, it's like um, all of the steps going up to that particular point where he does this strange action are very Christian. Um, like there's a, like a crucifixion pose and then there's the baptism and, and then he comes out and does his very own Boisean kind of kneeling um, gesture um, in the air and it's like how he expands on Christianity, how he extends everything and I think that's, um, that's just a little bit of a, an excursion into another thought but I just wanted to say that I found that so that image is so powerful for me about what voice work is about, about extending everybody, like extending Karl Marx, um, extending um, James Joyce, extending Marcel Duchamp. Uh, extending Novalis. I think that Boyce, um, he was always th had the sense that 
nobody finished thinking, like he was the one who came in and actually finished the thinking process for everybody with his expanded concept of art. It's like, you know, like I had to, I had to do the, the thinking work for everybody and I've got there and it's just a case of convincing other people um, to, to, pick, to help me find a methodology to make that, um, that concept truly socially transformative, which I find it's like this fascinating, um, outrageous hubris and at the same time a captivating undertaking. And that's, um, that's like I've um, not answered your question at all, but, I've, um, but I, will, I will answer the question, like what happened? How do we get playful in 2021? I think it was we had a really good look at the actions, whereas we tried to explain and explore and examine and criticize and investigate boys' work in 2008 and try to somehow explain the interrelationship of everything. Like what you said, you can't really uh, separate everything into neat chapters. Everything somehow is intertwined, but it, you have to bring a structure into it at the same time. So we tried to keep it open, like your tableau is mm. a sort of building, to what showing in, a, in, in an exhibition space, it's always much easier than it is in a book, because you know, in a book you have this linear form. And in an exhibition space, um, you can set things up so that one thing may be sort of speaking to this work, but it's also speaking to the work behind it. So um, that's always the challenge. How do you, how do you bring it? In? There's the same in 2021. We had exactly the same challenge in the book. How do you sort of stop it being too rigid? But in, in the exhibition, we, what we did was we chose 12 actions by Boyce. And um, because the actions were a really critical point in time and we found them to be extremely instructive for understanding what Boyce was on about in the sense that Boyce um, adopts certain figures like the nomad or the shaman and he works with these figures or the gardener if you think of um, 7,000 uh, Oaks as, as a gardening project um, and we looked at how Boyce uses these uh, actions as a, as a form of exercise, like he was relating to the so Socratic sort of exercises on the one hand, and the the, ex the spiritual exercises of um, Ignatius von of Loyola on the other hand, and somewhere in between these sort of philosophical and spiritual exercises, he was. Um, doing exercises in a bid to come up with a new um, thinking, a new form of visual vocabulary of how to how to how to enact this transformation that he had set as, as his goal as an artist. And, and we found that so exciting, this moment of just searching and, and looking and experimenting. And there's a clumsiness to it and a beauty to it and, and um, that, that opens up a discussion. And we, what, we, what we did is take these 12 actions and bring them into discussion with contemporary people, um, people being artists, if we take up voice on his um, axiom, I guess you could say, um, that, that everyone is an artist, that we, we decided to take that seriously. So we say Angela Davis is an artist, Greta Thunberg is an artist, um, Teja Shah is an artist, Nuria Goel is an artist, Susan Lacey is an artist. And some of those artists, as you can see, they are artists who would be at the art fair. Um, and some of those artists are artists who um, you'll be encountering at um, more in an activist setting or um, more uh, in a very private sort of mm. uh, community setting. So w we, w we just wanted to sort of put these people into a dialogue with Boyce's actions, people uh, who are also sort of searching and moulding their society and, and see what happens when they talk to Boyce, as it were, in the space. And, um, and some of, and just for example, <coughs> I just, I'll just name one example so it becomes clear that we have a Vietnamese um, artist called Andrew, Tuan Andrew Nguyen, and, um, and that's juxtaposed with, uh, he's worked doing an art uh, work on, on the nomadic and the migration, and that's juxtaposed with Boyce's work, the nomadic work with uh, Orazienstab, where he's looking at the nomad, it's this idealized figure of the nomad in, in Eurasia. And, um, and just by juxtaposing those two works, a very contemporary work with, um, with the, the boat people, it's called, the film's called The Boat People, um, where the artist really looks at the, <coughs> the advantage of being nomad and in the sense of always being on the move and being a quick thinker and um, adapting to your environment and sculpting your environment and changing things and, and, and also at the, ver the, the other side of that. Um, which is being um, um, being a migrant, being um, not rooted somewhere, not being welcome necessarily. The struggle that goes hand in hand with that, and so this juxtaposition shows how um, 
visionary voice work with the nomad was and how problematic it is and how troubled it is and uh, and yet at the same time how provocative and evocative and how much um it uh, and how calling for thought it is at the same time so um that's the sort of dialogue we wanted to get to where where people people talk to boys and question boys and um and you get a sense as a viewer what what does that what does boys say to us actually now and and i have been curious actually on on how these conversations took place i mean um being commissioned to or invited in a show on the legacy of boys is quite a uh, it's a it's a strong situation and i i'm i'm interested to hear a bit more about um yeah, how these conversations literally took place. I mean, were artists um, challenged or was there, di did you mainly moderate the discussion or did they take um, over? Or how this, did this exchange um, Actually, uh, my colleague Isabel, she was the, the, the main person to, uh, conducting the discussions with the artists and, um, and from everything that she told me, um, there was, there weren't the sort of controversial discussions that you would imagine because I think that people, because of the fact that we weren't saying, okay, you relate to Boyce in some way or mm -hmm. we, f we think that your work looks like Boyce work or that you use the same materials as Boyce or whatever, because we were saying um, we're looking at the idea of the nomadic, the figure of the nomad, um, then the artists didn't have such a problem with that actually. So nobody felt like they were being sort of co-opted into this kind of um, hagiography of Boyce or, the, uh, or something like that. It was very clear from the start that it was meant discursively and, and I don't recall Isabel at least saying that there was any instance of, of yeah. um, artists having a major yeah. problem with being um, yeah. brought in conjunction yeah. with Joseph Boyce. Yeah. So in a way you uh, it was about boys, but it was mainly about his topics. The ideas. Yeah, yeah so it brings us back to the contemporaneity of, of mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Boyce. Yeah, and, and, and uh, again, this uh, idea of the function as a mirror, huh? because mm -hmm. he, he didn't meet these artists, yeah. uh, he, didn't, he didn't talk to them, of course. This is, a, is an imaginary conversation, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it helps one to, to see uh, coherence yeah. uh, and, and make coherence. And I think the, uh, the strength is that it's it's not solely about boys, no? Mm -hmm. That that we're over this uh, yeah. this uh, let's say problem of having a, an exhibition that has only boys as a topic, mm -hmm. and it can relate to to other issues. No? So the monographic exhibition, as such, becomes becomes questions, and then that's that's the playful part, yeah. the experimental part. I liked it that it's called Übungen. Yeah. What yeah. I didn't get was cosmopolitician. I, uh, uh, is w what was the intention? Can you explain that? Uh, the um, Übung I get very well. It's yeah. the experiment. It's the it's the uh, the performative aspect. It's the didactic aspect. It's mm. it's the the teaching role. What uh, the cosmopolitan I didn't really get. I think it's uh, because we didn't really mean cosmopolitan, but cosmopolitical, mm. um, and it was this. Uh, it's also a troubled term and it, and it has many, many different definitions and um, takes on it. But I think we were thinking of cosmopolitical in the sense of um, that Boyce has it, that he has a universal undertaking, a universalist undertaking. And it's um, in a sense to um, suggest that the world, uh, the cosmos, the world consists of artists and, to, and that um, it's a way of thinking about subjectivity. Mm -hmm. um, co to be co truly cosmopolitical is to, to see, can, is there a way, in, I mean, it's one of the central questions we actually face in our time um, with this kind of fragmentation of society that we, that we notice um, drastically um, in, in recent times with, con with climate change and so on. It's like the question, how can we create um, a common subject that we relate to that doesn't somehow um, become hegemonic? Um, that doesn't uh, rule out difference. So, so what we thought Boyce was uh, endeavouring to do, and you can debate how successful he was, but he was endeavouring to create a subject that allowed um, diversity, uh, uh, sorry, unity and diversity, diversity and unity. Um, and um, that's why we call it cosmopolitical, because it's yeah. like a sort of attempt to, to come up with a subject. So you can be um, Catholic and a lesbian, and you can be um, all sorts of 
different have different identifications with various groups, and yet you can be um, an artist, or you are an artist, as Boyce argues, in the sense that you shape your um, environment, that you shape society, and that's what um, actually could be the thing that links us. Mm. And I think that that's what we're all we're all kind of grappling with at the moment: is what is the what is the the thing that gives us some sort of common subjectivity that enables us to act in a manner that um, demonstrates solidarity? Like, how do we get things done together if we cannot um, if we spend our entire time debating on identity issues? And mm. those identity issues are all really important. I'm not trying to say that they're not, but it's just like how can we do both? How can we also get a, a we, um, the revolution in via, we are the revolution. How can we get this kind of we happening? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's a question that Boyce raised. And, um, and, and I mean, we can talk for a really long time about how effective he was in that, because I mean, that's, I think it's very debatable, very easily to, easy to contest, because I mean, there he is alone on the poster. For those who know it, of the revolution, we are the revolution, he's alone on that poster. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's marching towards you or somebody, um, but he's, al uh, he's alone. So that's, that's, in any case, that's why we called it that, because we, see, thought yeah. we wanted to look at that question of, um, is, a cosmo is cosmopolitics a possibility? And if, then how and under what conditions? Mm -hmm. So it's more of a provocation. Yeah. Than an I think uh, certainly uh, one advantage is that it doesn't uh, repeat what has been kind of uh, v fashionable a couple of years ago that you would use uh, a title of his work as the title of the show. Right. This 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 mimicry, which uh, which is a little bit dusty after a while. No? Yeah. This, 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 the titles of his of his works are of course uh, very often fabulous. No. Mm -hmm. Wie man dem toten Hasen die Bilder erklärt. This. Zeige deine Wunde. Ich kenne kein Weekend. Yeah. These are all titles of, of movies and, and, and novels. But if you see them as an exhibition title, they of course lose their fascination because it becomes this yeah this mimetical uh, mm -hmm. reflex uh, towards the master. And and I think this uh, this year I saw very little little of that. No, Un unlike earlier years. Now it's more quotes, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we worked sayings. a lot with yeah. some yeah. for the campaign. Yeah. We worked a lot with yeah. the yeah. aphorisms. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, he he did put out. I mean, everyone is an artist is a fantastic saying, and and we can continue debating with that, and it's catchy, and some recognize, and if they don't recognize, it's still catchy. So I think it's now shifted a bit mm -hmm. into that direction. But I. Um, so I, I did want to get back to a question I asked. Um, so how did you become experts? And some of you may know that um, historically, being a voice expert was a lifelong dedication. And I'm curious um, to hear, you know, what will be your future relationship with boys? <laughs> yeah. So. Um some friends were a little bit worried when <laughs> I told them that I was working on boys. Uh, is he gonna? You know, um, funny. Is, is he going <laughs> to yeah. ent enter this this religious uh, brotherhood uh, and 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 then continue to to pray the gospel? Uh, so I, I I was not. Let's say I'm not completely converted. Huh? <laughs> I, I did not. I did not enter this brotherhood. I, I became much more affected. I have to admit. In the beginning, I had this. Uh, this slight distance, uh, and now I, I see that this, yeah, I, f I find it really much more exciting than in the beginning. I have to say, but I w I'm not, I'm not uh, a disciple, and I don't believe in boys. No, uh, so I see this as an uh, incredibly exciting and complex issue, which which uh, opens so many topics that it deserves to be treated in a historical way. But it's also, for me, an, an occasion to reflect on how we write art history, uh, how, this, mm -hmm. how this goes. Yep. Uh, one, one could do this with other cases. Uh, the advantage here is that there is so much scholarship and so much knowledge around that there is also interaction and, and possibility to, to, to discuss. And of course, I said mirror. Um, I see my mirror image of a teacher. I'm not an artist, but I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a, I teach students, and I, I like this very much. So 
the didactic, the idea to allow also students that didn't pass the entry test, the idea to criticize what, what you're doing in teaching uh, has been um, helpful for me also during this corona crisis. Huh? Uh, so, so in a way, Boyce, uh, Boyce was a source of um, inspiration. Uh, we decided we're going to follow the safety rules of the government, but we're going to not follow exactly the administration rules. So when they said, you're not allowed to teach your students on the campus, I taught them outside the campus because this was allowed. It was always allowed that up to 15 persons by chance meet in public space and by chance every week uh, we met our group. And, and uh, if the distance had to be uh, three meters, I decided, okay, this is going to happen with a megaphone. <laughs> uh, and this, this I saw also boys liked megaphones, of course, <laughs> in a different context. But I didn't want to uh, put on a hat and an angler veste. That would have been, been ridiculous. But to, to make fruitful a crisis, no? the pro or productive a crisis. There's nothing fruitful about a crisis. But make productive a crisis and reflect on it and reflect on, on why are we, we doing this? How can we improve it together? How can we learn from the students? That was a, was a source of inspiration. So yes, there I, I uh, want to continue to, mm -hmm. to increase my expertise. No? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was beautiful. Yeah. What do you think, Catherine? Next um, voice show in <laughs> five years? Or uh, would no, it be? No, it's probably more like uh, what Philip's saying to me too. Is like ta I think that um, just having voice in my backpack uh, so to speak, I think that it's just once you start to sort of think in these terms, um, and, and really critically, I'm, I'm, I'm similarly not a boys disciple, as I'm sure you've gathered, and which is probably why, uh, probably a good thing. Um, but uh, I, I definitely think, I think with and against boys all the time, I think that's a dialogue that's quite a useful thing. And my most inter my, the thing I'm most interested in uh, at the moment is this notion of staying with the trouble. Like it's actually an idea that you probably connect with Donna Haraway more than you do with Boyce. Um, actually, there are two thinkers uh, you would really not connect with Boyce, and Donna Haraway is one, as I just mentioned, and there's this amazing activist um, and theorist, Grace Lee Boggs. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's um, an American activist. Um, she was um, really big in the civil rights movement, and um, she was, she's sort of quiet um, in many respects, but everybody who was in the scene, they knew her. Like, I mean, everyone knows Angela Davis, but they don't know Grace Lee Boggs, and they were really good friends, and they worked a lot together. So Grace Lee Boggs is very close to Boyce in her thinking. She, um, she, because she was an activist, um, she came to the, a very similar conclusion to Boyce in the sense of thinking that revolution had to be evolution. And we all think we're in a major hurry, obviously, <laughs> because that we don't have time for evolution at the moment because um, the planet's in great danger. But what I found interesting about her and Angela Davis and Boyce and Donna Haraway is that they, they all investigated this idea of how do we stay with the trouble and still um, work in a peaceful way? Um, how do we avoid activism for the sake of activism and, um, and actually endeavour to change the structures that are underlying the problems? Because, and great, so Grace Lee Boggs, come, it, it's much easier to read her than to read Boyce because um, She's, uh, she's not trying to come up with this kind of universal system. She's not trying to say, everybody follow me, but she's just making this very pertinent point that Boyce also makes and is also at the center of his thinking is just like, how do we um, shape things in a way that um, takes everybody along with it and that where everybody plays an active participatory role in it and, um, and that it's long-term and it's non-violent. Um, and those were the, the those are the critical things that she's thinking about, and I think that's um, that that particular notion of how do we stay with the trouble, um, with these exercises, as I mentioned um, before, with the actions of voice. That's that's something that just accompanies my thought now, yeah. per se. So mm -hmm. that's what I'll take, and I, I shouldn't have any more voice books in bed. Um, that's uh, something I've got to stop doing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought that also was the staying the trouble is, is a very good entry point to, mm. to Boyce. I, I, I don't think that, that Boyce had a system. Uh, he never wrote a book. There was there's no principles in a way. There's there's, there's some slogans, but they're always yep. part of 
of trying to to figure out figure uh, out the system uh, what if there is a system and that perhaps makes it more attractive than those yeah. uh, artists that have closed systems and yes. the, the methodological task of course is writing and working with boys that uh, you know don't close it into a system yeah well it can't be closed uh, and and, and keep, keep it alive mm -hmm. so that, that others can continue to work on it and this is a, yeah. a sometimes a fine line no? because we we uh, we see that these um, attempts to 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 have the last word are also uh, f um, kind of this encouraging f for others then mm -hmm. to to continue. On. Well, I think that's I totally agree with you because like he was talking in terms of plasticity, and that's an inherently open-ended kind of utopia. Like it's not this sort of utop uh, and and an end image that we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. It was a, a something that was always growing and always shifting, and, and it wasn't supposed to be a closed system. And and at the same time, he spoke about totality, like and and used a lot of those sorts of words that made it appear like a closed system. But I agree with you. There was no, there was never a methodology. Mm -hmm. um, he was always inviting people to join him in creating the methodology, yeah. for sure. Like he had certain key points in it, like at certain terms. And it's the the dialogues are most exciting if there's others, no? It's, yeah. it's more. It's, I find often the monologue difficult to follow. It kind of is endless, like we, right? Uh, so the dialogue is is Open. Uh, <laughs> the dialogue <laughs> is more fruitful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was just one more anecdote because there was uh, a guy called André Müller, a very famous interviewer, who interviewed Boyce for Penthouse, um, and uh, and he said that you had to, you didn't have to get Boyce talking like you generally do in doing an interview. You had to stop Boyce talking. That was the, <laughs> <laughs> the art of the interview with Boyce. So some expertise here, but please, um, we don't have much time. But um, yeah, we're open for questions. There's one at the back. So this is a bad question. Um, listening to you both talk just now, I immediately just, I was sort of half daydreaming and I was thinking, are they talking about social systems theory? Is there any relationship between Nicholas Luhmann and Boyce um, for both of you? Um, yeah, they, they're, they're close, yeah. They're close uh, in time and uh, I think also in, in, in method. Uh, 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 Lumen also uh, doesn't have a beginning and an end. Everything uh, is inserted into the system and immediately made uh, productive of the system. And he's, he's fantastic. he was fantastic in dialogue. No? Uh, it was like a, uh, like a, a box champion and you have the different partners Sparring partners coming in, saying something, and after two sentences, they would fly out of the out of the ring. And I think that that's very close. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I think they even knew each other. Actually, didn't Boyce? I think he discovered Luman at some point, and um, he thought, yeah, this guy's on the right track. <laughs> um, but I've, I've only found one reference, so one one or two references to that, and um, I'd have to be I'd have to really struggle to find where I found them. But I remember thinking, oh, he actually knew Luman. In this, in this conversation, he makes reference to Lumen. Oh, he does? So he, yeah, yeah, that's he, how yeah, I know yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's in that, that's mm. a really famous interview. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's two more. Oh. Um, just to, uh, by, any, by chance as a student, I was uh, applying at the museum, which the uh, seminar for artistry was in the med center of the museum. And uh, contemporary art, which was presented there, was very contested. The, some students said there's nothing. And then when they added boys, when they added the snowfall in the, as a test before it was acquired, the professors and the students said, Oh shit, that's not art. That's <laughs> not. And I provoked it was 69 huh? when they did that. And uh, there was, I came from Paris and I said, I don't understand it, but uh, you can't say it's not art. I mean, we can't, you have to, to go from the present. So I was so much against not stopping a discussion 
that I provoke the discussion. And to make it short, i.e. The, the method of the history uh, annoyed me. I applied the first vacation uh, whether there is work. And by chance, I was taken by Dieter Kaplan to be a young student practitioner. And by chance, a year later, I, I went on working, but I'd study. He said, Kunz, we have, a, we have a, a great new thing. Maybe you heard of him. He came with his car with 160 drawings from, uh, <laughs> from by boys from Van der Grinten. We, we are going to do a show. It was also after when attitudes become formed. I heard about the fat corners, etc. Anyway, the provocation, then meeting boys, he was an incredible, suggestive, and almost hypnotic. And I was very much involved in in two shows, and Basel took the stir, the block boys by stir, that was the next job. And then there was Celtic, I saw Celtic in Edinburgh, by chance too. So I got involved, but then I had the idea I have to step back, because it, he is so magnetic when he was discussing. And about the thing, contradiction, hard fair not, that's a very uh, thin, uh, typical uh, way. He knocked, protesting at the door of the first art fair in Cologne with uh, Fostel, protesting, but he was inside. In Basel also, he, he, for him, it was not a contradiction, and he liked in the discourse contradiction as a provocative creative act. So mm -hmm. he, he worked with contradictions. So his system could never be closed mm -hmm. and and in, in itself an, an, uh, a system of thought which was considered it was always full of contradictions he was conscious of and he put in provocatively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, this that it persists with this openness and that because there are a lot of um, discussions about how ideological and how totalitarian ultimately Boyce might have been. But I think that the point that you made is, for me, the, the, the key answer to that is that there is no closure to the system. It's this constantly evolving, um, shifting form and um, inviting everybody to take part in, um, in, in forming that. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a question. I have professionally so many questions, but I have one to make it short. I serve uh, for um, an institution which has a permanent collection with uh, Joseph Beuys works, environments. And Joseph Beuys, for me, is the most uh, present artist you can imagine. All his work is permanent in Germany and the places I know in Switzerland, it's almost uh, permanent. He doesn't disappear and come back for reasons because curators and new generation decide that they want to have him on display for this and that reason. It's, it's always there. And institutionally, it's, um, I don't know if anybody ever decided to make it disappear, to make it more visible because it comes back, for example. And um, I think that only Susanne Pfeffer in uh, the Museum of Modern Art Frankfurt made the Blitzschlag with Hirsch disappear for, for a time, and I think not many people noticed. So what do you think about, is it good for the artist that he's so um, permanent in, in all these institutional uh, um, uh, settings, or uh, does it help him? It, does it keep the discussions alive, and so on. Thank you. Isn't that a question for you, Maya? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, sorry? Yeah, I moved it, yes. Yeah, so, so definitely. Um, that is a very interesting question, I think. And for one, one reason, probably, um, why boys isn't disappearing from our galleries is really a very practical one. It's work that needs to be, it's easiest kept if it's on display. If you start packing it and putting it in crates, it's a conservational nightmare. So I think that is one very practical reason. And then the other thing is, I mean, um, 
yeah, it's I yeah I I I moved <laughs> Joseph Boyce after 40 years of a permanent installation, and I it's mainly because um, um, we we by now have more space, so I felt like that the contemporary can shift. And it didn't uh, boys on that level for a building that is dedicated to contemporary art. Just didn't it didn't seem to be fitting anymore on that level. I I, I really wish, and I'm working on it. It's a long-term project. It's a, it's always long working with boys. I think, um, but I I'm working on uh, bringing him re. Uh, Re-socializing him in in the museum, bringing his work uh, in 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 touch with works uh, by his colleagues. That that's the one thing that I'm um, really interested in, and I think um, that uh, that is good for the work. Um, you asked whether being on permanent display is a good thing for the work. I do think I really think it needs a reactivation. I mean, it's just, I have um, continuous um, conversations with people in Basel. They ask, but how, wh what was it with boys in Basel? I really, you know, I just moved here maybe 10 years ago or five years ago, and I really don't make that connection. So it, the, the stories need to be told. They're not present anymore. And that is, of course, a generational thing also. And, and it's also about um, maybe shifting the perspective, as Philip said. It's not, uh, there are, it's not enough anymore to just put the work there, just put it there. You, you kind of have to uh, tell the stories because I guess the activator isn't present anymore. Yeah. But it, I think it is an advantage for the longevity and it's been strategically designed by the artist himself during his lifetime and, and certainly also by his widow uh, and some of his uh, uh, environment. Uh, in order to create a couple of uh, ensembles which are too big to sink. And, and this is, uh, I think, which cannot be neglected. No? And uh, the fate of other artists uh, is, is helpful. If you think of the Giacometti Foundation, I'm sure that the, the resonance would be different if we would not have uh, Basel, Zurich, these two, two monumental uh, poles. And others which, which, um, which uh, are more apt to be forgotten, no? because they, this doesn't exist. No? But a lot of the works travel. I mean, I agree, like it's, it's very difficult to get Saiga Deine Wunder, because when we did the Boys Retrospective in 2008, we tried to get everything. <laughs> so I can, I mean, I know um, with certain environments how difficult it is to convince um, for them to be moved, and usually it, you can only do it if it, the museum's being renovated or there's some other reason why the work has to, yeah. has to move for a certain point of time, mm -hmm. point in time, period of time, sorry. But um, I definitely think that every time we've, we, in, in, at Hamburger Bahnhof, we move the works around a lot. And, and that was one of the key objectives we've always had, is like to put the, the works in dialogue with other artists or in other contexts. Because I think, as you say, like you stop seeing things after a while, and especially if people, people um, are regular visitors to the museum, then it starts to become a dusty or um, fade into the background. So I think that there's, there's a lot to be said for um, ensembles, but maybe ensembles that move around the museum or bring other works into the ensemble to speak, or um, that where museums do actually send their works as they do um, on tour or, and let them be in other um, exhibitions. And so, and you, most museums do that with at least with the works that can be moved, and there are just some that can't be moved for, um, as Maya said, for conservatorial reasons. Joseph. It also costs a fortune to move them. That's another, that's another thing to consider. <laughs> Love this. Yes. So, uh, sorry, this is really a reaction to what you said. I've been living in the US for 16 years, and I came there in 2000. And in 2004, we did the last show, I believe, of Boys in the US, and nobody wanted the show. It had to come to Europe, to London, to the Tate. It was at the uh, Menil Collection. And I, I really uh, don't think it's true. Uh, Boris completely disappeared from American museum you know, collections. Uh, the only place you could always see him was DIA Art Foundation, but that well, was very, very special. Everybody else, Boris did not exist anymore. It had to do with a lot with Puchlo and certain people who 
really kind of dismissed him uh, fundamentally and politically and, and, and in all kinds of regards. But I believe it is, it is great if artists disappear and then can be rediscovered. And uh, so I do think there are advantages to both, but it is really not true that in many parts of the world, Boris has really disappeared and, and yeah. Okay. So I think this is it. Thank you so much for your endurance. It was a pleasure speaking with both of you, hearing you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Maya.